Hi, Philip. Hi, Manson. Hi. How are you? Fine. Very nice to see you here. <laughs> are you at home? Yes. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> How many students will there be, do you think? Um, <clears throat> at least at least 10 who's enrolled to this course, who's yeah. going to get credits out of this. Um, <clears throat> but there will be some more from outside. <laughs> How long are you, do you think you're going to take? It could be an hour, you know, yeah, could, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. I got lots of pictures. I mean, too many pictures, really. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Images, images are really uh, going to be powerful. There are quite many Chinese students who still not, you know, not understanding English very well. So images will help. Uh -huh. Of the 10, there's a number of Chinese. Out of 10, there are eight Chinese. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So this hmm. school, see, there are a few Chinese coming in. <laughs> <laughs> um, but nobody's studying architecture, are they? Um, some of them has majored architecture in the bachelors, and then hmm. they have transferred to, you know, other um, smaller scale design uh, departments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're not in our lab, but there are other people who is architect or architecture students willing to come in here at the at, at cookman university or or elsewhere yeah and um, both yeah okay <clears throat> unfortunately ji who is on site he really wanted to come in you're taking it anyway aren't you yeah Is that the Jeju Island? Yes. So he does so many day trips to Jeju Island. It's very awkward. <laughs> it's exciting though. Very exciting. Do you go out a lot, Philip? Yeah. Do you have yeah. to wear facial masks when you go out? Yeah, in the train. Oh, in the train. But not, not on the enough. streets. Not yet. I mean, I think they might start that. Um, do you uh -huh. have to do it in the street now? Everywhere. But that's new, isn't it? Uh, on the street, well, actually, no one forces it. But anywhere that's indoors and trans public transportation, you have to. Yeah, uh, indoors, right. in you have to. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, you can't yeah. get in. Because it's not, I mean, it's typical British, they don't really enforce anything. You know? <laughs> yeah, people will get, mm, yeah, not be happy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. No I one mean, like, like enforcing. Like you go in the underground or, or you know, on a train and not everybody's wearing. I mean, you know, some people just aren't, you know. Mm -mm. Most are, but, you know, yeah. nobody is enforcing it. And... <clears throat> I, I've circulated. Oh, hello. Hi. <laughs> I've circulated the Zoom link to um, old Maru families like Pyar, Junki, <laughs> Jonghwa. Yeah. Okay. They were very happy to hear that. Not sure if yeah. they're, they're going to make time to come in.
Okay, let's wait until three o'clock. About two minutes from now or so. Two minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, can anyone be unmuted if they want? Yeah, everyone's uh, mandatorily muted in order not to interrupt people who's talking at the very beginning. Uh, but you can unmute. Put yeah. If you want. I mean, yeah, anyone can mute, un unmute themselves. Oh, I see, okay. I can force muting. <laughs> I think most of the enrolled students are here. Many of them are from China and Herta is from Norway. Hello, Herta. Hello. Hello, teacher. Hello. Um, does everyone speak English um, okay that I can speak in English? All very, no. It all varies. Everyone varies. <laughs> Great, now it's three o'clock. Um, maybe let's wait for just one more minute and then start the introduction. Okay. <clears throat> Is it still hot summer in London? Um, it's going to be um, going up to the high 20s this weekend mm -hmm. or, the, or, or early next week. So it's quite still hot summer then? Um, no, or it's been a little chilly in the last few days, but um, it's going to go back up. There's hot air coming from Europe or something. Mm. Yeah. We had several um, storms. Is it hot in Seoul? Not really. We had several storms, like once a week, coming from the <laughs> south. And since then, it's not going over 30 degrees. And it's quite cooled down. And it's a bit cloudy today. For last down couple to, of weeks. Or what? Uh, highest temperature, 26. Oh, well, that, oh we don't, we're, we're, we're coming down to like 15s and that. Really? Um, Already? Uh, it sort of feels like autumn sometimes. Mm -mm. It's going to go back up in the high 20s, I guess, or something like that. <clears throat> Okay, that's London. Do you miss it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we can start. Start, okay. Um, let me do a little bit of introduction. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Okay, welcome to the Cookmin University. Well, I think there are quite many of you from Cookmin and some not. Uh, welcome to the Graduate School of Techno Design. Thanks for coming in. Hi. Uh, very good to see you all looking healthy. I guess this is how we greet people these days. Uh, this global online lecture series course is found by myself and Professor Chang Mi Sun in interior and furniture design lab to take advantage of our frequent use of online class system these days and to provide maximum efficiency in delivering various knowledges and wisdom to our graduate school students. Especially, in fact, 90% of our students at the Graduate School of Techno Design are from abroad we are very happy to import uh, global lecturers into the core of the master's course. This lecture series will not last for many hours. We aim to wrap up in an hour and 30 minutes. And for the question and answer, I will be collecting questions from you over the email and answers will be shared over the email as well. Let me firstly introduce Professor Philip Christo. I would like to highlight on the screen, I don't know how, <laughs> our first runner of the series this semester. 
Philip, as so many of you already know, is a professor in architectural design at London Metropolitan University since 1985. With Florian Bagel, who has passed away in 2018, Philip and Florian was in partnership at the Architecture Research Unit doing architectural practice, research and teaching. Philip was born in Canada, studied fine art and then moved to London to study architecture at the AA School. Architecture Research Unit has designed wonderful architectures in Korea, including Master Plan of Pajabuk City, and have been in intimate relationships with Korean culture and friends. Philip has so many wonderful knowledges to share with us, and luckily we will have two sessions with him, one today and another one in two weeks' time. So please come back again as per the poster that's been circulated. Please welcome with applause, Professor Philip Christo. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much. It's really great to be invited. Um, let me share my screen, okay? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, thank you everyone for um, coming to see this talk today. And it is really an honor to be given the opportunity to speak to you and to be the first one of this global online lecture series at Cookman University. Um, thank you, Minson, and um, for this kind invitation, and thank you to, for all of you people for attending. Um, I hope this talk will be of some practical and inspirational relevance for you as the students. Um, I'm going to be speaking as an architect and um, a lot about architecture and I'm going to show you a lot of um, pictures. Um, and I would hope that if you are, um, if you want me to stop and explain something or you don't understand what I'm saying, then maybe you can raise your hand and Minson can unmute you or you can unmute yourself and just butt in and ask a question. I don't know. I mean, if you want, you, I'm, I'm happy if you do that. And so also so in, in a chatting box, if anyone wants to know what uh, Philip has just said in an easier language, language or Korean, I can type it in. So um, do not hesitate to raise your hand. I mean, or, you know, or even just butt in and, um, uh, and I can explain again. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> Um, the, mo for most of the ideas and the things that I'm going to show you today, I am indebted to Florian Bagel, who Minson has already introduced, who sadly passed away two years ago. He was my closest friend and colleague for many, many years, and so I would like to dedicate this talk to him. In the late 1950s, a book was published titled Experiencing Architecture, written by a Danish architect and writer, Steen Eiler Rasmussen. So I thought I would give this lecture a subtitle. It's called Poetic Transformations of the Topography, but I'm giving it the subtitle Experiencing Architecture as Culture. I'm gonna to speak a little bit about that and perhaps a little bit more in the second lecture. Rasmussen describes in a wonderfully engaging way his experience of architectural space and how it could be described in terms of scale, proportion, solids and cavities, he calls it, rhythm, color, etc. I would like to extend this discussion of his somewhat and consider what is the cultural dimension in this discussion? What does culture have to do with architecture? What does it mean? What does one mean when we say culture? Um, a number of years ago, Florian Bagel and I were working with our students in London on a design research question that we called cultivation and culture. In this work with the students, we were asking the question, why do we have, I mean, there's actually a picture of Florian, there's a picture of Florian. Why do we have 
undifferentiated and unseemingly uncomfortable urban sprawl in many regions around the world. We think that sprawl, that means uh, cities that are pretty much unplanned and are um, uh, not very regulated at all in terms of how, what gets built. Is that we think sprawl is a cultural problem. It is occurring because people have lost a sense of time and history. Sprawl is the proliferation of locations without a sense of place. So we are wondering if there is a way that we can cultivate ourselves as architects and other designers, and through good example and education, this can be um, can affect positively the people and the urban landscape around us. Um, in the past, the qualities of place that evolved in a seemingly natural way as a result of local traditions, craftsmanship, and a close connection to regional and local climate and topography are easily understandable to us as having a beauty and a sense of, um, of, of um, good place. These qualities are very difficult to design um, on, a, on a computer or on a drawing board. They are the result of a, of a responsive, adaptive, and slow-moving building process. Our time is very, has very different conditions and expectations of living to the ways of life in a village such as these shown in the photographs by the 20th century French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson of villages in, the first one was in Italy and this is in Romania, or actually in former Yugoslavia, Kosovo. Um, and they were taken more than 50 years ago. So they are very different sort of places than you know, the kind of places that we are living in today, most of us. However, um, I think there are ways that we as architects can think and work that have a strong sense of time and are knowledgeable and responsive to local context and, and the beauty of the places that we live in. So culture in my mind is not limited to the aristocrat or the um, elite class or the rich or, or the, or the uh, privileged. Subcultures of all sorts are emerging all the time in modern urban society from place to place, as we experience all the time in fashion or music or in, in the art world. They seem to grow out of nowhere, these little cultures, subcultures of things that happen. It is part of the human condition and imagination that people tend to develop agreements about what is beautiful or good. And these things, of course, are subject to change from place to place and from time to time. In, architect, uh, in, architecture, no, um, in, in architecture, it seems to me that it is when these subcultural events or agreements are materialized in built form, they cohere and connect and make close relationships with local contexts and they become cult what I would consider to be cultural. This picture is uh, in um, Seoul and it's the um, Bexa village. Um, um, well, about six years ago now, but it probably looks pretty much the same now. Um, and so is this one. And this is another example of a kind of vernacular um, settlement that um, maybe it looks a little bit tatty and um, messy, but it is full of charm and a huge amount of, I would think of a, a kind of deep culture that we can learn from. I think it is the privilege and the responsibility of those of us that have had a good, the good fortune to be educated in, in these design dis disciplines that we extend and evolve and develop that cultural dimension that I'm talking about. 
This is our most important role as architects and as citizens, it seems to me, not to merely give professional advice to our client groups and, the, and to society in general about practical or technical issues, but to offer people a deeper understanding of their place in the world and a sense of history and time connected to the places where they live and work. So in this first lecture of the two that I will give you, I will try to describe some of these things with examples from my own experience of the work of a few other architects whom I've always admired greatly and whom I think we can learn a lot from. And then in the second lecture, I will speak about some of the projects that Florian Begel and I have, have done with our colleagues um, in the past years. In October last year, I traveled with um, a former student um, of Florian and mine, Eleanor Beaumont, who's now the deputy editor of the Architectural Review magazine in London. And we went to Oporto to see a beautifully curated exhibition of the work of Alvaro Siza, the architect and the Portuguese architect, whose work spans, the, the, in the exhibition, it, he, they were showing his whole career um, from the beginning of his um, uh, uh, architectural career. And we had the opportunity to visit Siza in his studio together with his close collaborator, Carlos Castanera. We were um, interested to see if we could find out how they have been able to build so beautifully in very distant parts of the world. As I have worked in Korea on building and urban design projects with Florian over the past 20 years or so, I was particularly interested to speak with Cesar and Castanera about their experience working in Korea with local executive architect collaborators. They have worked with several architects. We were wondering, what is the source of the poetic architectural imagination in Alvaro Siza's works? How is he able to continue to produce so many complex and beautiful built projects in many parts of the world as fresh and full of integrity and sophistication as the first buildings he designed in Portugal over 60 years ago? When visiting the exhibition, we were initially somewhat puzzled by the display of the most, one of the most recently built projects in Korea, the Saya Park Art Pavilion, completed in October 2018. The project was displayed immediately next to a previously unbuilt design Cesa had made for a site in central Madrid. As a first impression, the built project in Korea seems to be a direct copy of the Madrid design. This, uh, this, of course, surprised us, as we assume Caesar is usually res very responsive to the specific qualities of the site where he works. And this is an important part of his process of generating a design. It turns out the story is much more nuanced and complex. This is inside that building. Caesar explained that the Korean client said he wanted to build the Madrid project on a site in Korea. He knew about it and he wanted a, that, a, a, that, pro, a, that unbuilt project to be built on his land. The very strong and figurative form of the building was originally designed, uh, this is a sketch for the Korean version, but this is originally, well, it was originally designed um, in a competition one by Caesar for um, um, originally it, 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 for, as a museum, on, um, a military museum on a site in Madrid at, that was subsequently cancelled. Some years later, he was invited to choose a site in Madrid and make a design with an open brief as part of a group exhibition of architects. Being very familiar with the site of the previous competition, he decided somewhat in anger that the project had been canceled, the, previous, the first one, to use the same design on the same site, but to propose it so that it would house two 
very important artworks by Pablo Picasso, a large Guernica painting from 1937 and a sculpture of a pregnant woman. The Guernica was about death and the um, sculpture was about birth. I think this drawing here um, is, this is the plan here. It's very similar to the Korean version of what was built. And I believe this is the section here. So, so, so it's laying on its side, there's the floor and this is the roof. And these are like ele end elevations, I guess. This was um, the site of the Madrid. There was the, there's a plateau here and then there's a, it goes down to the river, I believe. And this was overhanging on this kind of cliff side. So it's or the, on this embankment. Here you can see it in elevation. So when the Korean client wanted to build the same design, Carlos visited Korea to select a site within the wooded hilly parkland that the client owned. He discussed it with Caesar, who was quite skeptical about the whole thing. They made a model of the topography and realized that the Madrid building was extremely enormous. This plan here was really perhaps four times the size of you know what it should have been, what, what it could be. So they had to scale the building down. They they um, joked that they had to sort of put it on a photocopy machine. Um, and so that it could finally be built. Um, and they had to adjust and adapt it to the existing shape of the hillside in Korea. Caesar told the client that, quote, it was made for the Guernica, and I'm sure you cannot find the Guernica and have it in, in your building in Korea. And the client said, no problem, you make two sculptures. So Caesar designed a beautifully rusty core 10 steel, that's what that was, was this one, um, piece hanging from the roof in the very tall internal space where light comes in from this, as you can see, an opening high in the corner of the room. And I don't have a picture of it, but the, in another part of the building, a large white marble egg to, to be displayed um, as the, uh, as a impression of uh, birth. Both were made in Portugal and shipped to Korea. One is something like an angel floating in the light, this one, or perhaps a Christ-like figure pertaining to death. And the other is evocative of birth. So here is an example of a project that did not originate from the site. It has been adapted to the site in a similar way that Christian churches have historically been built according to general types and principles given from where they've been built elsewhere, and then positioned in an east-west direction within a town and adapted and adjusted to fit into the local site conditions. So I think this is an unusual story in Caesar's um, career. Many people have tried to write about his work and find themes and traces of how the project is born. Um, these analyses tend to be wide and multifaceted as the work is complex and intuitive that he does. I would like to focus on one aspect of the work that I feel is of fundamental importance. Caesar's projects are always sensitive and delicate responses to the spatial and often social conditions of the site even in the case of Saya Park project described above, but perhaps in a slightly reverse process. I would say they are topographical. Even the buildings on flat urban sites or suburban house plots are imaginative and poetic, po poetic responses to the local topography or geometry and orientation of the given site. In my view, this is, of course, not the only topic, but it is a primary source of inspiration in Caesar's design process. So I'm going to read this quote out. Um, this is Caesar describing um, ma many years ago um, how he starts a design. And of course, it's, it's not very, um, it's not 
not very methodical really he, he it's quite um he does he, he does it in lots of different ways probably so i'll quote every design is a highly rigorous attempt at capturing a concrete moment of a trans transitory image in all its nuances so a transitory image maybe a kind of concept or an image that he has that is but it's not very firm but it has a lot of nuances it has a lot of um, uh, special qualities the extent to which this transitory quality is captured comes through in the designs which will be more or less clear the more precise they are the, the more vulnerable so he's saying if he can capture this transitory quality that's of the site or of, of an idea that, he's, uh, um, that, that he might have for the site and capture it and, um, and if the extent through which it comes through in the design hopefully becomes more clear. But the more precise or more clear it is, the more vulnerable it is. That means the more vulnerable it is to, um, more, perhaps the more, most, more delicate it is, you know, to being um, uh, um, decay or, or um, falling apart. I start off by visiting the site, nearly always with just imprecise conditions and a vague scheme in mind. Some other times I begin before that, starting from the idea I get of a place from other people's descriptions, a picture, something I have read, and indiscretion. So it really is like lots of little, the different sort of information that he might be working with, he, he might start with. This does not mean that much of what goes into the first draft will remain. It is just a start. So it, when he starts, it doesn't mean he has to stick with that. A site is valued for what it is and for what it can or is wanted to be. Two things which are perhaps opposite, but never unrelated. Now that's very an interesting point. So, well, clearly the site is very, very important to him. He's not an architect that, um, I mean, as, a, like, as the Saya Park project, he doesn't do that. He, um, and he was very um, skeptical of, of doing that, of bringing a, bringing a building just and placing it on the site um, from somewhere else. He's, he's looking very carefully at the site and he says it's valued for what it is already or for what it can or is wanted to be. So he's looking at what it is as carefully as he can, and he's thinking about what it wants to be, what it can be or what it wants to be. So it's our, the, the site that I, I understand him to mean by this, that the site already indicates to him what it could become or what it would want to become. But those two things, what it is and what it wants to become, are sometimes are perhaps opposite, are very different from each other, but they're not unrelated. The very well known and highly loved early projects are clear examples of this topographic, highly sensitive site specific approach. Both the early swimming pools in Matoshinos, where Caesar was born, the pool at the Quinta de Conciaco, I don't know how to pronounce that, from 1958 to 65, I'll show you in a minute. And this one, the pool at Leque de Palmera, 1961 to 66, are essays in the integration and coexistence of the man-made and the natural characteristics of the land the artificial and the natural and the coexistence of those. The architectural interventions make the existing geological or urban character more visible, more understandable. 
the natural and the artificial or the, or the built context and the proposed building fabric never assume similar forms. The poetry resides in the dialectic and dialogue between them, each informing and living from the other. Those rocks are forming the, these concrete walls and the concrete walls are forming the rocks. They are having a dialogue and, a, and a, they, they're depending on each other for, for, their, for their visibility. Careful judgments are made in deciding how much and how little to build. The building form is guided by the inherent morphology of the physical and spatial characteristics of the site as the architect sees them. The long parallel concrete walls of various heights here at the Lake de Palmira, some retaining, others defining straight edges to horizontal floors, intensify and articulate the long horizontal nature of the site as an embankment to a coastal road. The pools are then formed with low horizontal walls that capture um, water on the edge of the sea, as you can see here, with some natural rocks forming in the pool. And the horizon of the artificial horizon of the, of the low walls is mirroring the horizon of the sea in the distance. And here you can see you're looking back towards this, this um, the edge of the sea here, this rocky edge, and there's a road up on this, um, at the top of this embankment along the coast road. And the building is, there's a building in between, or there's a series of, of walls and something like buildings that um, he's formed in between this, the rocks and the road. It's kind of like an embankment. It's something, the whole thing is a bit like these um, type of pools that one can find on the coast of France and Brittany where they were made for growing oysters. Similarly beautiful in the way that they are, the artificial um, rectangular form is, um, has, has a dialogue with the natural form of the rocks in the sea coast. Similarly at the Quinta de Conchiaco, or however you pronounce it, long retaining walls and stairways, ledges and long straight enclosing walls that merge and connect with the buildings and platforms of the pool all combine to form an artificial acropolis-like ensemble of spaces at the top of a hill with natural vegetation. So this is a plan. And these are all retaining walls and sometimes lower or higher walls. But the swimming pool is here. And these are buildings sort of on the edge of this slope and on the edge of this type of like top of the hill. Um, and there's a platform here that one enters in and goes up these stairs, or you can come up these stairs. And th this is within a park that Caesar, um, Caesar's um, teacher designed um, within a, um, where there used to be a monastery. And um, so Caesar was given the opportunity to, well, as a very young architect, I think it was in his, in his 20s, to, um, to design this pool within the, this new parkland that, the, um, that uh, Tabora, Fernando Tabora was designing. So it looked something like this, those buildings that are on the edge of the pool. And these retaining walls amongst the forested slopes are long and um, making horizons um, as you look out um, from the top or as you, as you walk up. Buildings aren't in a in position which you would expect. They're somehow in the in intermediary um, space between these walls on the edge of the, um, of the top of the hill, this plateau that he's made with a, with a swimming pool. And they, of course, have the 
dressing rooms which are very, very beautiful, very, very plain. And a very beautiful use of natural light um, in a building like this where you don't have to heat it. This is not an attempt to hide the building into the ground. It is the inverse of this. The built form is a, what I would think of as a cultivation of the site. The buildings are not standalone objects in the landscape. They are part of a topographical ordering of the site that extends across and into the land. Alvar Alto achieved this in many ways in projects such as the campus of the University of Yvaskala in 1951 and previously here at the Institute of Technology in Otunemi in Finland in 1949. Both of these projects have similarly like the CESA um, pools, they have a, an extensive array of retaining walls adjusting the gently sloping topography, forming amphitheaters, routes, boundaries and terraces in the landscape between and within the interiors of the buildings. This attention to the interior and exterior topographies of the floor made by retaining and enclosing walls formed in response to the natural contours of the site can also be seen in the German, the modern German architect Hans Rune's design and many designs of his, but uh, for example, in this house, for um, Mr. and Mrs. Bench in the mid 1930s um, in, the, um, in the suburbs of Berlin. Um, and he was working with um, a very, very important and interesting landscape architect, Herman Matern, of whom he also designed a house similar like this. In this case, this house, um, the, that arrow is pointing down the slope to the view. And I think this arrow is pointing northward. And, and so these walls are a kind of retaining walls and, and walls of the house. And they slightly radiate and then turn into a curve. And so, the, so these floors are kind of stepping down with the, with the slope of the garden. And the garden, here you have it, the section where the, these, they're stepping down inside the house and then in the garden and it goes down, 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 long way down to, and there's a lake in the distance. So the form of the building is the kind of covering of the topography or it's a, it's a, it's in a way formed the, the ground is somehow formed first, I believe, and the walls are extended and there's some roofs put on them. Here's a view of the garden looking up towards the house. It's hard to take photographs of this kind of um, spatial relations that, um, because in one view, you, you will have to walk through this to, to get uh, understanding of it. Here you can see inside the house that curved um, exterior wall that we saw in the plan. And that's from the other side of the house. I mean, I think, you know, it, it drops down to the right and behind. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright at Tallison West um, in the late 30s and into the 50s also comes to mind as a reference. And, but these examples are strangely quite rare in architecture. I would argue in Alto's and Caesar's case, the attitude towards the formation of the ground topography into a built architectural spatial form has its roots in the ways farm terracing walls have been built since ancient times all over the world and particularly in their case, they've been looking, I believe, at in the Mediterranean region or at ways vernacular towns and villages in Greek islands and medieval settlements 
in many parts of Europe are formed by the shape of the ground. For Alto and Siza, this attitude is translated into contemporary construction and architectural design language and Shirun uh, as well, I, um, I would have to say. Caesar is not afraid to cite the ancient Roman city of Pompeii as a source of inspiration when designing the fields of patio houses and um, array of walls that he built in the Quinta de Malagueira social housing project in Evra, Portugal, um, that began in the late 1970s. This is, this is Pompeii with a kind of the ruin of Pompeii as, you, as it looks now. Um, and these are some photographs of this housing project um, in Evra in Portugal, where Caesar has um, very um, sensitively laid a mat of patio houses with a rather um, rigid um, grid and, and typology, but that varies, they, you can see they vary in, in um, height because they have more or less, some have, are, 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 have more rooms and some have less rooms, but they are of a similar type. So they have a kind of variation in like a vernacular village as a result. And the way they sit on the ground is like a mat that lays on its um, on, on an uneven surface and, and rise up the hills like, like in a vernacular village. It's a very beautiful place. There's Florian looking down from the roof of one at night. And Caesar did this by, um, when he first went to the site, this is a kind of sketch at the beginning of the process, and he's looking back towards the ancient city of Evra in the distance here, it's on a hill. And the site is on the outside of the city in a former farm, um, what they call a quinta. And he's thinking about, he's standing here thinking about where would be a good place for the center of the town, the new, this new settlement. And it would be a place where you could stand as it is here and you could see the center of, of, of the old town. So at a relatively high point, he thought that that could be a place which could be the, a kind of um, public center. And there was already existing this, um, this walled um, farm yard, I guess you could call it, or um, which is the, where the, and the, the rest of the land was open land mostly, but there was some already some settlement of um, um, a kind of shanty town um, settlement over on, over here, and these roads were existing, and or this sorry this road and this road, and so. He's working with what's there, but he's imagining, as he said, what it wants to be. Yeah, and in this project, I mean, it's, um, it's really beautiful because he, he brings in these um, aqueduct structures, similar to what exists in Evera and, and as a from um, so, uh, num from about 500 years ago, and these are these um, structures are the backbones to this um, new fabric, this new city fabric. They give a structure to it, and they make also public um, arcades and walkways um, uh, through the town, like that. They carry the um, electricity and the gas and the water and so on above ground rather than underground. And this, but the idea is that they, they are an infrastructural, an architectural infrastructure rather, not only a functional infrastructure. That is um, the bigger structure that ties together the town.
Kenneth Frampton understands it this way. Kenneth Frampton, the um, architectural theorist, um, when writing about Caesar, he writes, quotes, he makes us aware that any construction is both topographically and temporarily predetermined, and that all we can do is to modify the fabric of the moment as it lies suspended between one historical instant and the next. So in a way, he's, you're, we are just adjusting in, a, in, a, in, a, in our time, in a, in a kind of moment of our time, um, things that are already predetermined on the site. And we, we, um, the, the, the project is suspended between one historical instant, instant and the next. This inherent adjustment and close fit with the site is not only limited to the early projects or those in parkland or landscape settings or those that have um, a sloping or you know, um, irregular landform or topography. One can detect it in some way in almost every CESA project, I would argue. For example, in a suburban one-family house, such as this one, which is called the Alves Santos house in Povoa do Barzim in Portugal, that was designed in 66 to 69, the low boundary wall to the street is one of a series of parallel wall planes of various heights and profiles, all of the same material, that step back into the distance as one views the house from the street. You can see this wall here is coming right up to the pavement. And then this wall here is a low wall, which is part of the this wall of the house. And then this is a higher wall of the house and so on. He has a series of walls that are sometimes a kind of fence and sometimes are a part of the, of the house. Um, and in this way, um, on a flat corner suburban plot, the topography is not made with levels of the ground surface. It is made with walls and the spaces formed within and between them. The house encompasses the whole plot and has a sense of being an ensemble of buildings rather than a standalone object building. So here is the, we were looking at, at the, this elevation here it's on the corner of this um, building. And um, so th this was the um, low wall to the street that we saw. And then this was the sort of medium height wall that joined up with this wall of the house. And this was a higher wall and this was even the higher one. And in all this corner sort of L-shaped house um, is formed in this kind of L-shaped site which is relatively narrow at the back. Um, and in this way, he's making a very uh, generous and lovely courtyard. That's the elevation as a drawing of, of the low wall of these series of walls stepping back. It's quite um, elegant, isn't it? This is a, a photograph of the, from a book of, um, I've not ever seen this house, I'd love to see it one day, of the um, internal courtyard. And the house, in, the inside of the house itself, similarly is normal, but, and yet um, has incident, is not um, regular or, um, so here we're looking into the courtyard, I believe, and here we're looking into the front um, um, space, which has this, these walls. And as a result, these, these windows are of different heights. They have a different um, purpose. And this high window, the wall comes around and then steps here. So this space of the high window somehow has a depth just by doing that. And this fireplace somehow is a kind of erosion into that corner. These walls are, you know, forming the, 
the space of the whole site. They're not just there to be boundary walls, they're there to give spatial depth. I think there's a view from that garage that has, it comes from the front from the front elevation that we saw. And that's what it looks like um, from the street. I mean, just by the sheer um, um, means of making this wall at the front white like the house is, um, and I think this has been painted um, and it was originally a, a render that was not unpainted I believe but even so there, it was always that all the same material this wall then becomes part of the house not just a fence here's another house of a similar time and he um, is in a photograph from a book as you can see and um, here that it's a there is in a more um, wealthy district um, in Oporto where these are large um, houses from the late 19th century and there's a, a, a this is a long narrow plot um, a, a narrow frontage and so he has he continues the front wall of the uh, neighbors with this, in this case, it's a, this white is a steel plate and uh, cast concrete house and this wall. And in this way, he's, he's, he's building up again, similarly like the last one, these, these long, low horizon lines that are receding into the distance and the vegetation is somehow mediating. So we were looking um, from this end here. This is like the street here. Um, and we were looking at this wall and then this, the house behind. And it's a long house. And this curved wall turns into the, to the, where the car comes in here. Um, the house is a flat roof house um, and very, very plain. This is as that wall turns around and comes into the, the side, the long side of the house. And into this um, patio, that entrance patio, that white wall comes into the inside of the house. Like that. We see this again and again in Caesar's projects. The terraced zigzagging walls in the garden behind the Galician center of contemporary art. This is the front elevation to the city, but already indicates this um, um, a kind of ramping topography. Um, uh, this is the, the center of contemporary art in Santiago de Compostela in Spain in the late 80s. Gently and naturally follow the slope of the hillside, and this route continues within the museum interior. The walls and spaces zigzag all the way to the roof where one has a view of the profile of the city. So in, I, I don't have the plan, a, a pity, because I, I couldn't find a good plan, but um, this building um, is built in a site right next to a, con a very ancient convent. And Caesar kept this little house here and built a series of long retaining walls that step that slope up this uh, hillside on to the left of this picture. And these, um, that, that one has pathways that go up and it's next to the gardens of this convent and uh, there's a cemetery there. And, um, and these walls and these ramps continue inside this building. Um, it's hard to see in the photographs. I'm going to quote what Caesar says about it, what he told us um, when we were um, discussing this with him in his, in his last year. Quote, one thing that I always look for 
is not to marginalize what I don't like, and he means what I don't like of the site, but to take it and accept it. He was explaining to us, um, yeah, actually he, he's gonna explain that here. Um, again, I had a big chance with the garden and the museum in Santiago de Compostela. The director wanted the museum inside the garden. I'm gonna go back to this other picture. He wanted it back behind here, behind the, in, um, up, up the hill. Um, he wanted it inside the garden with, in brackets, recurrent fear of the modern architecture. And I insisted that the museum must come to the street. It is not an annex. It is a building important in the urban life there where people will go, a public building. Then I must have it at the street. Then I could make it a, a hole with the convent. So he puts it right up next to the convent and it's, it's built with this, um, the same stone. And the, uh, the, so I could make it a hole or like a, a, as a real um, complement with the convent. And the convent is a very beautiful thing. And I was able to retain a small house so I could make a kind of door to the garden and a transition of scale with a small house to the garden. If you notice, the garden was very important because it goes up in a sort of zigzag. And if you look up to the garden and to the museum, it is symmetric. And you go up to the garden in a zigzag and you go up to the museum in a zigzag inside. And from the roof, you can look at the whole town, the cathedral, etc., and look to the garden. And the museum inside is a bigger, it, it is a part of the bigger topography. So I don't have many pictures inside, but this is one of them. You know, as you maybe know of his work, he's not only making topography of the floor, but he's making a topography of the, the whole spatial um, sequence and of the ceilings. Okay. This sensitive, sensitive attitude towards the site combined with a watchfulness about specific building techniques available in different places continues on recent projects of larger and more complex scale in Europe and in distant places such as Korea, China, Taiwan, and Japan. Ever since the early 1980s, CESA has taken a positive and energetic attitude when working on projects outside Portugal. Initially in Berlin, and subsequently in Holland, Italy, and Spain, he took on international projects as there was little work at home. We're looking at the, um, um, probably, I suppose, the largest project that CESA has ever built, I, I can imagine. Um, this is the, um, um, the building that he designed together with Kim Jong-Q of um, Maru in Seoul um, um, and Carlos Castanero, his partner in, in Porto, um, for their more Pacific uh, laboratories. I'm going to quote Cesar again about what he says about um, working in, those in these distant places. Quote, it is very stimulating because it is different so there is a work coming from curiosity. I think I might have this. No, no, I'll come back. Um, so there's a work coming from curiosity. If you feel curiosity, you want to think new things. It is like a renovation in a way. We can become young. It gives enthusiasm, a condiment needed for architecture. I had many difficult moments in professional life, but sometimes I had a big chance. And in Korea, I had a big chance to work. Carlos goes there about every one and a half months, and we have the projects in his office with a very good team there. In Mimesis, that's the, the little gallery that was built at Padre Book City, we made a big model to test the ceilings with the air conditioning, the lights, 
how it works with the complex building geometry. We made an immense model that I could enter inside with my head. In the Amor Pacific Development and Design Campus, Kim Jong-Kyu was able to be in contact with the workers because we would go every one and a half months and it is not enough. In the meantime, there could be bad things happening, irreversible things. JK was able to go on with the details as they happened. If there was some doubt, he would call. Sometimes came here also, to the, so the continuity of the work was guaranteed." End of quotes. So when one takes an initial look at the ensemble of buildings designed within the Amor Pacific campus that was um, designed in 2000, from 2007 and completed in 2010, the largest of the buildings that houses the main research laboratories seems to be the project, the one on the left here. On closer inspection, one can see that the site is not flat and there are several large existing buildings, open fields, and a number of other new buildings. The project comprises several buildings designed for the new campus in addition to the existing buildings. There's the 26,000 square meter main laboratory building, this big one on the left, a 3,000 square meter guest house, which I'll show you in a minute. It's down there amongst these, that, that, um, that those red walls there, I believe. Um, two pavilions and a gatehouse, as well as several further new buildings that Kim jong Chu has designed. CESA has integrated all these buildings into a connected whole with long retaining walls in red brick, as you can see here. These walls are part of and extend beyond the guest house giving spatial boundaries to the whole campus. So this is the guest house here. And these are the existing buildings that were, that Amari Pacific were using previously. And, and on the left of this picture is the large new building of the laboratories. One of the pavilions is built into the ground amongst these retaining walls. I guess maybe this is the pavilion and um, amongst the retaining walls. The other is a cantilevered concrete figurative building that hovers over the walls like a large bird, this one here. These walls and new buildings do not hide or obscure the existing older company buildings. They build a topographic series of terraced fields or land steps, providing an ordered territory, a sense of place and direction for the existing and large new company buildings to be located. The main research and design laboratory building is a steel frame structure hovering over the ground above the first floor level and clad in long horizontal sheets of gray patinated zinc and glass. This is that bird-like concrete one. You can see Korean housing in the background. And here we are in the ground floor um, spaces of the large building. And um, so th th this is this gray patinated zinc and glass with much of the ground floor open, as you can see here. A clear and elegant tectonic of material distinctions is made between the red brick garden terracing walls, the structural piers and base buildings that stand on the ground clad in dark gray granite or gray granite, yeah, and the large long volumes of the main spaces of the building clad in zinc and glass, which is there. Oh, um, this is the zinc in the courtyards in between the, the wings. This tectonic distinction of the primary building elements gives a sense of ease and naturalness to the whole site. The outer parts of the terraced fields have been planted with many trees as the client is, has a keen interest in this. And I would only wish that the large exposed ground surfaces could be a little bit more natural or wild, planted with 
tall meadow, meadow grass or cultivated more productively with vegetables or orchards or small forests. Maybe one day that will happen. This architecture of retaining walls and fields is asking to be more actively inhabited, I think. The masterful orchestration of spatial rhythms in the open fields is as gentle and elegant as the topographies of ceilings and courtyards in the interiors. Each of these projects, both exterior and interior, are masterworks. I think that's it. I'm going to, I, will, I, will, I was thinking of showing you um, some pictures of another architect, but I think that, um, that I'm going to end there because it's, um, uh, it's enough, I think. It was great. Don't you think? I agree. I was curious about, um, as per your subtitle that you gave me before, the draft title, which was including Secret Leverance and Dimitri. Yeah, Pekionis, yeah. Yeah, well. Um, For the next time, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or. Um, this is great think, enough with Caesars. It's, a, it's, it's very, very dense, isn't it? Mm. It's wonderful. Do we want to have any discussion now? With, if anybody wants to. Um, I think it's easier for everybody due to the language um, different level. I think it's better for us to um, go through them again and then maybe review and then have questions and then uh -huh. come back to you and you can answer it back to us. Okay. Uh, was how, how was it for people? Was it um, understandable? Would anyone like to um, give us a review and comment? what you think Herta did you want to talk something I think your microphone is off oh actually I, I it was very interesting and I know you last semester we talked about him as well so I knew a little bit uh, before but it was yeah it was wonderful. Yeah. I mean, uh, there were quite many, um, many phrases that you mentioned where it was applicable to our current furniture project as well. Mm -hmm. Because, as for instance, um, working with what's there, but imagining what it wants to be. You know, that's, that doesn't always apply to architecture, but I think it applies to everything. Wherever yeah. we have to deal with the context or the conditions that we have. It's yeah. It, it was it was amazing. Me yeah, suitable um, comments. And Alvis Santos' house. That was just like what I'm trying to um, design a little house for a you know a private a client, where it's on a hill, um, but we we're trying to, you know, have layers and layers. You know, trying to make the scenography out of it. Yeah. And and. Yeah. These projects are just like perfect, and and not only just one. There are quite few of few, of, quite several of Alvaro Caesar's project where it has and the references. I, I almost take a project of his and discuss it in this way. I think yeah. mm. I like to get all of them. <laughs> I think <laughs> the topography. I mean, where he designs the topography on a flat uh, area. That that was yeah. something. Um, because these days I do think about the pitched roofs and the the reasons to have the pitched roofs it, and it mm. just like yeah matches everything with it. Amazing. Mm. Great. Yeah. And don't you think that um, that was amazingly um, brilliant? That those red walls in the um, um, in the project are a similar brick to the existing buildings mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. and so they it, it's, it was a way as he he described that he doesn't he, he probably didn't like doesn't like those buildings they're pretty ugly uh, kind of old yeah. buildings yeah but he says to himself it's not a matter of liking or disliking them it has to accept them they are there and they're you know they're they're part of the context 
Mm. And so he, he makes them better by giving them these walls that they can, um, they can extend out to the, um, and be part of, you know? Absolutely. So he includes those, rather than, he could have put a great wall of trees or something so nobody could see those buildings or, you know, some other architects would do, you know, but yeah. um, he's done the opposite. He's given them um, a topography that of, of, so that they, they, they have a place now, yeah? Mm -hmm. And the new building has, yeah? I think that was, yeah. Mm. It's it's very relevant also to um, you know the sense of place that many mm. like product or furniture designers don't actually think about. Uh -huh. But architecture, you you just have to, and like the 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 Picasso museum and the one in Saya uh, Art uh, Park that was you know pretty pretty relevant to you know what we have to think about when it comes yeah. to think about the sense of place um you've been there haven't you to say that part yeah, i've been actually yes is it is it a beautiful place amazingly beautiful place uh -huh. i think yeah. it, they'll open in one or two years time so you have to come uh-huh oh it's not open it's not open to public yet. Uh -huh. But is that because of COVID or? or no, or uh, they're building the the whole Saya Park is isn't completed yet. They're building uh -huh. the last bit of architecture, which is the hotel, in the very uh -huh. um, front gate, so that it can actually accept people to stay and you know not just go back home in, in the in the in the same day. Uh -huh. So I think with the hotel, I think they they would open the place. Oh. It's a huge park. You won't believe it's uh, owned by a private person. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So oh, you're it, welcome. in two weeks' time, will you be talking about uh, further of other architects or will you be talking about the Belgium um, project? Um, I don't, I, I'll be talking about projects that, that we've done in the past. Uh, yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. It'll be more exciting. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much. Okay. Hopefully, it was it some use to you guys. Yes, everybody. Applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, goodbye, everyone. Would it be possible for you to share us, uh, share with us? Um, some sort of a summary of your talk that would be really helpful actually yes I guess so yeah amazing I mean there w this was based on a um, text that I the reason why I went to interview um, Caesar uh -huh. was um, the architectural review wanted me to write about Caesar's working in Korea ah brilliant because I because I had been you know working there so so um, and that piece is published so that was pub it's short, a much shorter version of that was published in November issue of the Architectural Review. So I, um, yeah, of last year. Mm -hmm. We can share that too. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. And it was an issue about, um, you know, people working in foreign lands. Mm. Uh, yeah, that, that's... Um, but they had to make it quite short, uh, you know, because they, had, they don't have that much space in the magazine. Yeah. I feel very lucky to listen to your whole full story. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everyone. We'll see you um, next in two weeks. Yep. Thank you yep. very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, you too. Have a nice weekend. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.